Uh, first of all, good evening, evening everyone. Uh, first thing I would like to do is to thank both Premier Wellbeing and the Vicare for the kind invitation to take part in this webinar. Uh, and also to all the colleagues that might be uh, connected. There's no doubt that surgical uh, technologies, including thinner scopes, uh, digital scopes, lasers, the last one being the super tulum fiber laser, and even robotics for uh, retrograde internal surgery uh, have capped um, most of the advances in the, in the and innovations related to stone disease. It hasn't happened the same uh, with pharmacotherapy for stones. And uh, despite going on, on the rise, the, the cost going on the rise, uh, there's no much investment in this area. And this is very important because this is a recurrent uh, disease and uh, these special patients uh, have the risk of uh, end-stage renal disease that uh, uh, rise a lot the costs of this uh, of this problem. Well, kidneys, we could say that kidney stone is the sum of the urine composition that in normal uh, in a normal situation is a balance. Uh, it's a, there's a balance between promoters uh, and inhibitors. But we need two other factors uh, for, a stone, for a stone to form, which is a pH and time. Urine pH is a key factor for stone formation. Uh, it is well known that calcium phosphate supersaturation in quickly increases at pH uh, over six and higher than that. The prevalence of calcium phosphate stones uh, is on the rise nowadays. And one of the conditions favoring uh, its formation is the combination of hypercalciuria, hypocitraturia, and alkaline urine. Some patients present with renal tubular acidosis, featuring hyperchloremic acidosis, hypocitraturia, and alkaline urine. Carbon, uh, car carbonic anhydrase inhibitors as acetazolamide and also topiramide can also lead to a similar scenario. On the other side, acid urine, uh, acid urine pH is the most important factor for uric acid stone formation. Uric acid is a weak organic acid with a formation product of 5.5. At that pH and lower, uric acid crystallizes even and even with uh, more than two liters uh, of water intake a day, uh, there will be uric acid precipitation if the secretion in urine exceeds 800 milligrams per day. Obese patients due to hyperinsulinemia or ins insulin resistance show a decrease in urinary pH secondary to a dysfunction in ammonium excretion in urine and acidification, urine acidification at proximal tubule. In fact, in the last years, we can see that lithiasic patients show up with high body mass index, increased abdominal circumference, and high rate of body fat. These findings can be related to an increased oxalate, calcium, and uric acid excretion in urine, increasing the formation, the stone formation risk. Whenever the pH, urinary pH, is in what we could call the protective zone or non-lithogenic uh, pH range, that's between 5.5 and 6.2, and always in supersaturation conditions, calcium oxalate, both mono and dehydrate stones, can form, normally by heterogeneous uh, nucleation. The initial core of the stone being either uric acid or calcium phosphate, depending if the pH of the urine is nearer to one or another extreme pH levels. Theoretically, urine pH can decrease due to 
uh, an increase of acid intake, an increase of endogenous acid production, and also an increase of alkali loss. But also we, with, can, uh, with, for, uh, due to a decrease of urinary ammonia. In the other hand, the uh, alkaline pH can be due to uh, acid base alterations, urinary tract infections, those situations uh, leading to a failure to acidify the urine, like renal tubular acidosis, chronic kidney disease, aldosterone alteration, etc. And uh, finally, we can find uh, we can uh, we can find also alkaline urine uh, secondary to an increased intake of uh, drugs such as salicylates, acetazolamide, bicarbonate, and potassium citrate. As you all know, when dealing with stones, it is key to know the stone composition. 80% of the stones are calcium-based and uh, the rest comprising struvite, uric acid, and cysteine, among others. It is also essential in order to compre comprehensively uh, treat or prevent stones to perform a, co a complete metabolic evaluation not only to those recurrent stone formers who we were talking about before, but also in those patients with other risk factors that can be due to stone-related diseases, anomal anatomical abnormalities, or genetic or general factors. The stone-specific uh, metabolic evaluation is key for stone prevention, as I said. But drugs to be used should have should have the, the um, should halt the stone formation, have no side effects, and be easy to take to administer to the patients. This is important in order to achieve good compliance from the patient, which is also essential. Most, fre most frequently, abnormalities found in calcium stone formers. Uh, are increased excretion of, of, of promoters. You can see the most frequent one is hypercalciuria, but also decrease of inhibitors. The most important, the citrate. And the treatment is perfectly established for each particular case. Sometimes, and sometimes combinations of these drugs uh, are needed. Deficit of inhibitors is an an interesting part and can be managed by administ administering potassium citrate in cases of hypercalciuria or hypocitraturia and magnesium in cases of hyperoxaluria or uh, hypomagnesuria. Together with thiazides, potassium citrate is one of the most commonly used drugs in stone disease. It prevents calcium supersaturation by complexing uh, the free calcium in urine and uh, also acts as a strong inhibitor of crystallization. We can use uh, orange juice, for example, uh, to avoid taking medication, but we will need quite a, a big amount of, uh, of juice in order to get the uh, therapeutic ranges. Potassium citrate, you'll know, can decrease can decrease uh, calciuria and can increase citraturia, but it also increases urinary pH and calcium phosphate, and subsequently calcium phosphate supersaturation. In fact, there are several evidences showing that calcium oxalate stones Showing the calcium oxalate stone treatment, sorry, with potassium citrate can lead uh, to the formation of calcium phosphate stones, increasing the risk of calcium phosphate stones. A more effective combination in inhibiting uric acid and calcium, uh, calcium oxalate crystallization was reported by PAC back in 1992, and that's potassium magnesium citrate. It also, it, also slow nucleation and growth rate of stones and is used 
in bowel diseases uh, as hypocitraturia, hypomagnesuria, and hyperoxaluria can occur. Despite being a, a strong inhibitor of calcium oxalate uh, crystal formation, phytate is not included in the guidelines normally, probably due to the scarce clinical studies reported. Its creation is clearly related to oral ingestion of fruits, vegetables, and cereals, and is associated to a lower risk of incident nephrolithiasis in, in, different, in different groups of patients, as reported recently in groups with different age and sex. As you see, there are well-known inhibitors of calcium oxalate stones, like citrate, phytate, and magnesium, but no specific uric acid stones inhibitors. A few years ago, grasses and co-workers in Mallorca started studying some substances like xanthine, nicotine, caffeine, and theobromine, among others, and published the role of the latter as a dose-dependent inhibitor of uric acid crystallization. They showed that using theobromine concentrations equivalent to those obtained after consum consumption of theobromine, uric acid crystals, were thinner and longer. And in the presence, in, and it happened more when there was more presence of theobromine in, in, the, in the sample, increasing the solubility and the dissolution at urine pH values above 5.5. But apart from that, uh, they, they found that there was a synergistic effect of theobromine and mm, the citrate uh, giving super, uh, being superior to the sum of the effects of each component separately. Urine pH must be taken into account whenever dealing with kidney stones, mainly for proper treatment. In fact, the European guidelines algorithms show pH modulations in each type of stones, but mainly when pH is extreme in uric acid stones and in cases of infective stones. In cases of uric acid stones, for example, they even uh, make the difference between the prevention and chemolytholysis, uh, in which the, the aim is to reach different uh, pH levels. But there seems to be consensus on calcium oxalate oversaturation being independent of urine pH. However, in a recent study, Manishorn and co-workers studied the effect of pH in different phases of a stone formation, like crystallization, addition to, of the crystals to the cells, internalization of those crystals into the cell, and the crystal protein binding, and found that both crystallization and addition were dependent on pH. Both were maximum at pH, uh, a low pH and minimum at high pH. Internalization was maximum at pH seven, whereas there was no difference, there were no differences for crystal binding to proteins irrespective the pH value. Another issue is that we are increasingly, increasingly suffering, we and the, the patients and also uh, all who, who have to work for them, we're suffering the complications of double J stents, sometimes forgotten and showing surface and internal incrustations, mainly in the presence of urinary tract infection and alkaline pH. Although it also happens in cases of uric acid and cysteine uh, stone patients with acid urine. As you can see, this is not a recent worry. And 20 years ago, we uh, presented a preliminary study on the effects of phytate and citrate on double J stent and crustaceans, suggesting the potential benefits of using these inhibitors in these patients. 
Afi months ago, Torrecilla and co-workers published a double-blinded double blinded multicenter placebo control trial conducted in 105 patients uh, enrolled with, with indwelling double J stents enrolled in, in nine public hospitals in Spain. And they were assigned randomly into intervention and placebo groups. Uh, they were follow for three to eight weeks and both groups self-monitored their daily morning urine pH levels. The primary outcome of analysis was the degree of stents, stent ends incrustation using macroscopic and electron microscopy analysis of crystals after three to eight weeks of inwelling period. The intervention group seem to benefit from a lower global incrustation rate of stentens than placebo group. Considering the secondary endpoints, treated patients reported also greater urine pH decreases. And you can imagine that an acidifier was used and it was the control pH down. They concluded that the use of this new oral composition is beneficial in the context of ureteral double J in dwelling by decreasing mean as well as global incrustation. In fact, incrustation was found to be eight times less probable in the experimental group treated with lead control. Another important issue is how we measure the, measure the pH. We know that deep stick pH measurement is not reliable neither for guiding clinical decision-making nor to guide medical management of nephrolithiasis. It also has, is not useful for spot urine pH determination and are not reliable even though multiple readings along the day are performed. The Koning and co-workers in 2018 evaluated several methods for pH measurement, comparing to the gold standard, which is the professional lab pH meter. And they reached the conclusion that lead control portable electronic pH meter was a reliable pH measuring device. So in order to assess or evaluate the utility of this pH meter, and the thiazic patient's management with nutraceutical manipulation of urine pH, the prevent lead study was designed. Uh, seven different uh, centers enrolled 143 patients that were follow up uh, during three months. Two groups of patients were established. The first one uh, composed of 78 patients with history of calcium stones and pH of ba at baseline more than uh, superior to 6.2, uh, uh, well administered, lead control pH down twice a day. As you can see, the control pH down uh, contains L-methionine and phytate. The first one decreases urinary pH and the phytate inhibits crystallization of calcium oxalate and calcium phosphate. The other group, composed of 65 patients with a past history of uric acid uh, lithiasis and pH at baseline less than 5.5, 5, than 5 .5, were administered one capsule twice a day of lead control pH up. Lead control pH up is composed of magnesium potassium citrate and theobromine. After the basal visit, patients were evaluated each month during three months, gathering data regarding adherence to treatment, adverse effects, and analytical data, including a, a, pH, a pH in the sample of first morning urine after capsule ingest, ingesting. Of course, to uh, measure the pH, the lead control pH meter was used.
This is just for you to know how, how simple is the use of this pH method. You can see after calibration of the device, we move it to the urine sample and there's no place for interpretation as in the strips. An exact pH value is quickly displayed on the screen. You can find a, this is the, at the very first device and you can find the, a video of the, the new uh, model in the DeviCare webpage. So going on, in the global study population features, as you can see, mean urine pH in the acidifier and alkali alkalizer group were 6.7 and 5.1 respectively. And uh, most of them, as you can see, over 90% of patients in each group were recurrent stone formers. And one of the and one third of the patients, more or less, with uric acid stones, had had been under previous pH control therapy. Which were the results? We found that both nutraceuticals, lead control pH up and pH down, were significantly effective in normalizing urinary pH. At all follow-up visits compared with the baseline. And that was more evident in the alkalizer group with a maximum uh, percentage of patients who achieved non-lithogenic pH, about 55% at day 60. Yet these figures, you can see the same uh, more clearly. All the changes in urine pH in both groups, more evident in the alkalizer group and were significant at each visit when compared to the, to the baseline. And more importantly, uh, both lead control pH up and down had a sustained effect over time, in the whole period of study. When we analyzed the effect of treatment compliance at 60 days, we, we saw that 72% uh, of compliant patients and 46% of non-compliant achieved non-lithogenic pH range. For those compliant, up to 75% of the patients in the alkalizer group treated with lead control pH up reached non-lithogenic pH values at second visit. We also performed a logistic regression analysis uh, with risk factors for colic events and found that non-lithogenic pH at 90 days and compliance at 60 days of treatment were independently associated with colic complaints free survival. And the uh, As you can see, the probability of the new stone event uh, dropped more than two times. Finally, the investigators, investigators' satisfaction with the control pH up and pH down was good or very good in more than 80% of the cases. And the uh, reported tolerance was over 90%. Whereas adverse effects, all of them minor, were registered in less than 9% of the patients, 13 out of 107 patients. So to conclude, I would say that urine pH is a key factor in stone formation, which we always have to keep in mind uh, when considering other metabolic alterations. Combination therapy decrease, decreases, decreases adherence to treatment. When we combine magnesium to, with citrate, we may increase citrate inhibitor effect. 
Phytate is a strong inhibitor of calcium oxalate crystals. Theobromine as new inhibitor of uric acid stones may prevent the, recur the recurrence of this uh, type of stones. And it has synergistic effect um, with citrate. pH determination should be performed with pH meter always. And finally, nutraceutics are useful at regulating urine pH and lead control can decrease the probability of new stone events. <laughs>